Good evening, everybody. Thanks so much for coming. Um, I think we've got uh, almost half of you here right now. Thank you so much for joining Junction Reads uh, and our reading and discussion with Sharon Kirsch and her memoir, The Smallest Objective. Uh, before we get started, um, as always, I would like to start with a land acknowledgement. We will start with an acknowledgement of land. I am sitting in Tecoronto, as is Sharon. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Wendat, Anishinaabeg Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the New Credit First Nation. Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. It is still home to many Indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work in the community on their territory. As some of you may or may not be in the territory, you might may be in territory outside of Toronto. I invite you to offer your own personal acknowledgement. Sharon Kirsch, thank you so much for joining us. I have had such a great time reading the smallest objective. Um, thank doing, you. And uh, especially, I'm I'm a research fiend, especially the last. Uh, tidbit of of the book, which oh, yes. uh, anybody out there who likes history and research and all of that kind of stuff, I hope will thoroughly enjoy it as much as I did. Thank you. Um, before we, I, I start with your bio and your reading. I would one would like you to share what you're reading right now with everybody. Sure, I do read mostly, I'd say, contemporary fiction. But at the moment, I happen to be on a classic, which is "The Heart Is a Lonely Hunter" by Carson McCullers, and I'm sure some members of the audience will have read this. It's a wonderful book. She wrote it when she was 23 years old, which is just astounding to me, the degree of insight. Uh, for those who aren't aware of it, it was published in 1940, and it's set in a Georgia mill town of the 1930s. There are four or five central characters, all of whom are not really mainstream. They're all loners or people who have a sense of themselves as being somewhat different. Perhaps the most central character is somebody who can neither speak nor here, uh, but is known to be a person of great compassion and wisdom and somebody to whom the others uh, like to turn and confide. And then there's a young girl who is about 14 years old, coming of age with a passion for classical music, who feels perhaps somewhat misunderstood. The rather reflective owner of the local cafe, uh, a socialist agitator turned drinker, um, and then there's also uh, a, a very topical element of race here. Uh, one of the characters happens to be Jewish, but more uh, interesting perhaps, or at least another dimension is that there is an African-American doctor uh, who is somebody struggling for dignity in a community of white people and also struggling to uh, protect his own health and that of his community, which of course, as we're seeing now tragically in the pandemic, uh, may suffer unduly compared with others. So I think those aspects make it really timely despite the age of the book. Uh, I, I will just add that some of the language in it is of the period. So language, for instance, uh, used to refer to African-Americans is not uh, the terminology we would prefer now, but I think there is no evidence at all of racism in the author herself. Self, if anything, all the characters are treated with extreme compassion and insight. Um, and I don't know if you want to add anything, Alison. You yeah, can obviously no. read it as well. Yes, no, she has a, a, an aptitude for writing characters, definitely from the margins, but characters yes. with such depth that yeah. it, it's like tear jerking sometimes. Yes, uh, exactly. To witness them experience the world yeah. from, from their perspective or from other people's perspectives. I haven't Definitely finished yet. You obviously know the full yeah. story. That's okay. You have not given it's been, anything It's away. been a while since I've read it, but I've yeah. also read other stuff of hers. And she yeah. uh, she's a very uh, character motivated writer, which is exactly the kind of writing that I like. So yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, it was a hole in my reading of the classics and one I decided to catch up on during the pandemic. Yes. Good for you. Yeah. Good for you. That's awesome. Um, so before your reading, um, and I'm, I'm, uh, thrilled that you're going to share some of uh, the smallest objective with us. I'm going to share your biography. Sure. Okay. Sharon Kirsch is a well-traveled writer and the author of two books, 
What Species of Crit Creatures, published in 2008, a book of creative nonfiction about first encounters between early settlers to North America and unfamiliar beasts. And The Smallest Objective, a memoir that explores ancestral memory and ancestral history. It has been included on top lists of books on Alzheimer's and best ever titles about the real Montreal. Sharon has published fiction, narrative nonfiction, and journalism, most recently in Subterrain and Room magazines. Sharon Kirsch is originally from Montreal and has lived in the US and the UK, the latter as a Commonwealth Sch scholar for the postgraduate study in Middle English literature. She is a graduate of the Humber School for Writers Correspondence Program. She currently is based in Toronto, and you can find out more about her and her work at www. Dot Sharon Kirsch dot com. Thank Sharon, you, Alison. Again, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, shall I begin the reading now? Yes, please. Okay. So I'm going to read uh, two separate short segments. And I know there are some people here who've read the book and others perhaps not. So I will just uh, set the scene for you for this first little bit. Uh, this book begins with a search for buried treasure. My father, uh, before he died, instructed me to look for a buried treasure in the family home uh, before selling it. And so at the time that this book begins, uh, my father has died perhaps 10 years before. My mother has sadly developed memory loss, which is a theme and situation uh, that is traced throughout the book. And I've had to move her to assisted living. So I undertake the search for buried treasure and it proves more difficult than I imagined. I thought I would just read the carpet and find it but in fact I have a carpenter friend who accompanies me to Montreal and we have no success and then some archaeologist friends uh, astoundingly and kindly offer me a team of archaeologists my very own archaeologists to come to the house to travel from Toronto to Montreal and help me look for the treasure and so the scene I'm about to read begins here with my uh, team of archaeologists and they are in my mother's bedroom closet. Closets are where we hide some of our most intimate things, what we don't want others to see. My father aside, no men were ever admitted into my mother's wardrobe. This space was once the domain of the bespoke black brocade maxi coat and matching sleeveless gown, the smoke perspex sandals with the red leather uppers, the postiche that gave my mother's beehive hairdo the thrust of a model skyscraper. During my early childhood, my parents regularly attended cocktail parties, weddings, and bar mitzvahs designated black tie. They left me at home in my puffin pajamas, returning after midnight with morsels for my breakfast, bites of fruitcake, or a chocolate mint in a crumpled napkin. From an agency, they employed mature single women to ensure I brushed my teeth and went to bed on time. Some of the caregivers were unnerving. One told me how she'd sleepwalk out of her burning house as a little girl, carrying a favorite desk that even a grown man would have struggled to raise off the ground. In recent years, the sitters had been hired for my mother and her wardrobe now was filled with New Balance orthopedic shoes and racks of faded house dresses, all of the sameness. That the team of archeologists would enter my mother's closet was preordained. Inside lay the only bit of bedroom floor still to be mapped. I opened the accordion door, motioning to John and Blake, after you. The space was compact, the task urgent, and John and Blake's time running out. I retreated to the kitchen, where I began to pack up my mother's crystal bone china and curios. Along with the ding of crystal and the clank of china, could be heard the by now familiar clicks and whines upstairs, the GPR at work. Then, more unusually, a staccato, steps, from the hall adjoining the bedroom, on the main staircase, in the downstairs hall. Thud, the kitchen door was flung open. Blake stood before me, half exultant, half restrained. I think we found something. The two of us sprinted up the stairs and into the bedroom where John was fingering a floorboard until now hidden beneath a shoe shelf in my mother's closet. See this bulge here, said John. I nodded. Feel. Undeniably, something was pressing against the underside of the board. Did you get a reading from the metal detector? Big time, said John. What do you want to do? Both men looked at me expectantly. The floorboard was in the closet. The closet floor was under carpet. This section of closet floor was beneath a shoe shelf. At issue was a single board. Let's go for it, I said, 
John angled a hefty screwdriver against the swollen board and began chipping away at it with a hammer. We had neither a drill nor a wrench, no circular saw level or pliers. Shit, the wood had splintered under the pressure of his blows, breaking into slivers as sharp as shards of broken glass. A single nail, the upper half of its shaft driven flat into the pine subfloor, now lay exposed. I'm so sorry, John said to me. He turned to Blake. We better start loading the car. Not to worry. I'll clean up after you go. To allow enough time to close up the house, I would booked my return on a late train. Wait, I implored them. Before you leave, you should have a memento of my father, a seashell. I led them into my father's office and to the aquariums where kissing gouramis once brushed up against angelfish and guppies bore generations of transparent young that were all eyes and tail fins. From the arrangement of shells in the drain tanks, John chose a mollux, Blake a tulip. I waved the team off, collected a green plastic garbage bag from the garage and made my way back to my mother's closet. Gingerly, I began to pick up the shards of wood, taking care not to draw blood. Illness shows no hesitation, not even illness that ravages memory. It needs no reminder, proceeding with certainty to its next move. On my way to the train station, I stopped briefly at my mother's apartment. She wore what I'd come to consider her uniform, brown trousers with an elastic waistband, one of two pink polyester shirts, and a cardigan. She seemed more tired than usual. As I prepared to leave, she followed me to the door. Where are you going now? To Granny's. Her mother, my grandmother, had been dead for more than 20 years. That's the end of that first section. And I'm now going to shift us to something quite different. So uh, later in the book, as some of you will know, uh, I begin to discover objects that belong to several family members, uh, lost family, people I either barely knew at all or didn't know. And uh, one of these, uh, my uncle Jockey, great uncle, I should say, Jockey Fleming, was my mother's uh, great uncle, her father's brother, and he was a renowned Montreal personality of the mid-century uh, for perhaps uh, questionable reasons. He was somebody who lived at the margins of the law, uh, who worked as a ticket tout for blue bonnets and the hockey playoffs at the Montreal Forum, and somebody who was a purveyor of information in sealed envelopes. He held other people's secrets. He moved in celebrity circles. Uh, he sometimes transgressed the law, as we find out later in the chapter. Uh, and so I want to introduce you to him. And I will just tell you that the one time I did actually see him in downtown Montreal, and I was perhaps eight or nine years old, my mother grabbed me by the arm and dragged me to the other side of the street. And she said to me, he's not a bad man, but his family are ashamed of him. And uh, I might have known him because he lived until I was about 13 or 14 years old, but that was my only glimpse. So here we go with Jockey. Among the many conundrums of Jockey Fleming is this, how such a fundamentally anxious individual chose a lifestyle that for most would have induced uncontrollable anxiety. Equilibrium for Jockey demanded performance, telling the good enough story, like the time he was mobbed by guys hoping to buy tickets for a Saturday football game. The scene attracted the notice of a police officer who had trouble squaring the ordinariness of Jockey with the fervor surrounding him. When the policeman asked about Jockey's doings, Jockey replied, they're just trying to get my autograph and I can't give it to them all. Before the official could formulate his disbelief, Jockey had hailed a taxi cab and jumped into it. In the post-war era, the entertainment profession in Canada drew numerous Jews, especially in Quebec, offering both a living and a way of countering the invisibility foisted upon European Jewry. Jockey exercised a legitimate claim to being an entertainer, not an Al Jolson whose raccoon coat Jockey wore about town when his buddy Al was playing the Princess Theatre, but a standard gag man at prenuptial festivities and clubs of lesser distinction, the Colony Club or the Canadian Legion Hall. By his own count, my great uncle performed at more than 1,500 stags. There, in the presence of an audience, he found himself genuinely at home. Jockey's cachet only increased with the 1950 publication of Al Palmer's Montreal Confidential, which was a kind of gossip book. And so with, uh, in the following years, he infiltrated the home of his estranged nieces by way of transistor radio or the TV set with rabbit ears. 
He was playing the Park Casino, making a guest appearance on Radio Canada's Carte Blanche, broadcasting from the show bar with Mr. and Miss Music. Now, this next part uh, is italicized, which makes clear in the book that is partly imagined, but there are some factual components as well. Montreal in the 1950s, the diners, mostly parties of four, are seated at round tables encircling the stage. Linen napkins in the form of perfect cones dot the tabletops like starched white topiary. The waiters wear long sleeve white shirts and silky black bow ties. On stage, showgirls in sequined bikini tops and transparent hula skirts are finishing their routine, their breasts and feathered hair pieces quivering in union, unison. MC, and now please welcome a Montreal treasure, famed raconteur, and one of this city's savviest operators, the jockey without a horse, Mr. Jockey Fleming. Jockey, seated among the audience, breaks into a gallop, vaulting over the velvet rope to assume his position on stage. He whinnies. The women toast him with their Mai Tais, the men with their Canadian clubs straight up. Jockey, welcome, welcome. Say you, pal, he points to a man with a bald pate and florid complexion. You heard this one? Little Jewish guy tells his wife he don't want to be kosher no more. Why? Because he has to bring home the bacon. Whoa, Nelly. A bum spends all his time in book joints. When he finally goes to jail, they put him in charge of the library. Giddy up. Jockey prances on an imaginary mount. He wears a shirt of vivid color, loud, some would call it, emblazoned with names and pictures of famous racehorses and their riders. Jockey again. Here's one for you. A guy has a pretty, a real doll. So why does he give her up? Because she always puts him down. The MC motions for Jockey to wrap it up. Jockey, finale. And now, ladies and gents, a song for you. Jockey launches into his signature tune, Deep in the Heart of Texas, in what one naysayer has called the world's worst baritone. Twirling an imaginary lasso, he canters off stage to rapturous applause. At home, the nieces are removing their makeup after date night. My mother writes in her diary, B kept letting his hands wander and we necked. I thought he would lose all respect. In a year, she'll be photographed wearing a mortar board, a fully qualified teacher. She'll dangle iridescent balls from a classroomed Christmas tree for children with names like Gittel Rudansky, Jaime Glitman, and Brian Slepchik. Several years later, she'll emerge a bride. Jockey was absent from my mother's 1955 wedding when Jockey's brother, Maurice, wearing white gloves, a black top hat, and a spray of white carnation, escorted his older daughter to the chuppa, an imprecise look in his eyes. That summer, the first of my parents' marriage turned out to be the hottest in 50 years. Following their honeymoon in Virginia Beach, the newlyweds moved into their semi-detached house with its freshly excavated basement. In a home movie from the era, my mother, smiling and ebullient, her arms and legs moving too fast is planting a rose bush in the back garden, surrounded by the skeletons of half-built houses. She wears tortoise shell glasses and a subtly printed blouse, dock Bermudas and flats. The front and garage doors of the house are painted the harsh blue of fluorite, a mineral common to industry. At the end of that year, to mark their first anniversary, my father presented my mother with a sapphire and diamond starburst brooch. Decades later, the gifts had stopped and my father, when he sought to undermine his wife, summoned up a name, your uncle Jockey. Well, that's the end of that one. Thank you so much. I am so glad that you read that on stage uh, joke oh. <laughs> with Jockey. It was so enjoyable, so funny. Oh, thank um, you. <laughs> and, and vividly written, like I could really uh, imagine myself sitting there I have to take responsibility for quite a few of those bad jokes, but I kind of imagined him to be corny beyond belief. <laughs> right. The giddy up, I think I laughed and I was, I just closed the book. Yeah. Um, what I, I loved, and I, I always find this when I read memoir that include characters outside of, of the, the narrative voice, yes. is how, how like by happenstance or, or luck, how rich these characters, these relatives and ancestors' lives were. Have you Absolutely. ever thought about uh, either creating, uh, you know, a, uh, or doing the research and creating a longer memoir or writing a, a short story or positing them, Simon, Jockey, and, and yes. your Aunt Carol as characters, central characters in a work? I think Jockey certainly could lend himself to a longer work. Um, it's interesting, the idea of turning him into fiction. And I think certainly the, the voice is there. It's already established. Uh, 
he was much feted by the journalists of the time, particularly columnists, some of whom had quite a literary bent. And um, we really don't know who Jockey was under the surface. He created a persona for himself, which was reinforced and in turn created by these journalists. Right. Uh, and I think I'm the first person to have written about his family. I'm quite certain I am. Nobody knew even his real name, which was Moses Rutenberg, or very few. Uh, the fact he was Jewish, I think, was widely known, but rarely alluded to. Mm -hmm. uh, and he really lived his life as a personality without children, uh, without a, an obvious long-term romantic partner of any kind. So certainly uh, one could. I think do an interesting work on, on the man underlying all of this surface. Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, I found it interesting treating him as a nonfiction character because he is a, in a way so implausible. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. One reviewer actually said that he looked him up. He Googled him to see whether he was a real character. This man thought I might have invented him for the convenience right. of my book and was assured by the number of um, hits he got in his yeah. Google search that in fact he does genuinely exist. <laughs> so, um, yep. Yeah, so I think that would be the interesting angle to take with him. Who was he really underneath? And mm -hmm. that perhaps would, would work better uh, as a fully imaginary piece. Yeah. Um, in terms of my Aunt Carol, uh, I haven't told uh, the audience anything about her. Some of you already know this, but uh, she was a, a young woman, my mother's sister, who came of age in the 1950s and early 60s, as she was a very bright, vivacious, and forward-looking woman, very progressive, taking advantage of the op new opportunities for young women at that time. She had trained and worked in her early life as a physiotherapist. She also was traveling quite widely uh, to the Caribbean, and I recovered many of her objects in the house, like her postcards from the Caribbean journeys, her recipe cards uh, and recipe book of treasure for my daughter, a book of Jewish recipes. She came to a tragic and very sudden end, which I will not uh, describe for everybody. And there is actually an element of mystery in it, but that is a terribly sad story. Mm -hmm. I think it would be very hard for me to go emotionally to, to expand yeah. into that at that level. And so I was thinking, well, uh, in relation to your question, if I were to write something further about Carol, perhaps it would be interesting to fictionalize her and give her the longer life that she never had. And I wonder who she would have become, uh, yeah. how she would have developed. And it's, it's a very interesting period in Montreal at that time. Mm -hmm. Of course, uh, she died just in the lead up to Expo 67, uh, the period approaching Trudeau mania. Uh, th there was great feeling of optimism and hope the Champlain Bridge had just opened up and people were flying, they were wearing these extraordinary clothes, their mini dresses and, you know, the white leatherette purses. And um, so there would be a fantastic detail that you could bring in there. I tried to, to include some of it in her chapter, but of course, there's a lot more one yeah. could draw upon. Yeah, yeah. I loved um, how you drew out the, not, not necessarily conflict, because you, you certainly feel the love between uh, your mother and Carol, but yes. there is a, a, a kind of cultural and social conflict in their age difference and yeah. the freedom that Carol had and, and not necessarily the lack of freedom that your mother had, but that cultural and social imposition that that your mother felt. Yes, it was. A, was they grew up in thought. somewhat yeah. different times. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, my mother was born during the Great Depression and she was an incubator baby uh, at a time when they really did not know how to look after uh, premature infants. So she probably was not handled uh, and given the sense of physical security she would have needed. Uh, and I think that perhaps had some influence on her. Uh, and the, the anxious person she became. Her sister was a much bolder personality by nature, I believe, uh, but she did grow up in a different era. It was uh, more after the Second World War, whereas my mother was uh, not merely a Depression era baby, but old enough to have uh, really 
um, experienced her middle childhood during that war period. And it was obviously a time of great secure insecurity um, and a different kind of time for the Jewish community, uh, which in Montreal really enjoyed a kind of renaissance after the Second World War. In uh, 1951, I learned that Montreal had the largest Jewish community outs in the British Commonwealth yeah. outside of London, England. Yeah, which was not something I ever was aware of uh, growing up. I was not alive at that time, but, uh, but I, I simply hadn't realize the significance of it yeah yeah so, yes yeah exactly Mon two different stories Montreal as a as a place I mean you know there are there are a lot of books where Montreal is the central character but you know historic Montreal and and all of the movement from you know uh farmland to all of these uh becoming yeah. all of these very different neighborhoods right like just Culturally, exactly culturally different neighborhoods yeah I mean I remember yeah. farmland very very distantly in mm -hmm. the early 60s when I was a tiny child uh, there was still farmland behind my parents house uh, yes. in the west end the English speaking area of the city yeah. and that disappeared soon after yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. But it was also a city of immigrants and, you know, there were many groups coming in, uh, certainly that period in the early 20th century was a huge period for the Jewish immigration um, right after the turn of the century. And then there were, of course, Italians and many other groups coming in and yeah. contributing to the city. Yeah. 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 That's great. Um, I, w I am always fascinated and, and not necessarily, this doesn't always happen in, in, in memoir writing um, because I, I also enjoy the, the creative side of it, but I was so impressed by the detail in some of the scenes and, uh, you know, especially in, in, in scenes where you're sitting with your mother or you're in the house with your mother or without, out yes. your mother. And the first thing I thought as a writer was Sharon must be a note taker. <laughs> and some of the scenes, and and I loved uh, all of the the notes that you you discovered that your mom left, and yes, and how they tied in together with this feeling as a writer that Sharon must be a, a very <laughs> a complete note taker because there are some scenes where I truly feel, and I know that you wrote the wrote this or. Um, completed it years after uh, your mom died, but feeling like I'm seeing that scene as you're sitting in that room with your mom. Do you want to talk about that? Like, do you, are sure. you a note taker? Did you, are you a journaler? Um, yes and no. I, I do take very detailed notes at times and other times I take mental notes. I have a very good memory for odd detail. So for instance, I could probably tell you where I sat in a restaurant 10 years ago. I, I will remember the table, which mm -hmm. is really quirky and, and ultimately probably irrelevant. <laughs> but, um, so I don't have to write everything down. I did take a lot of notes uh, during the period that my mother was failing. And so that is not just from my uh, recollection. Uh, my mother herself was a compulsive note taker, as I mentioned in the book, and I grew up with stacks of notes, the kitchen table, the dining room table, the kitchen walls, all had notes on them. My mother wrote not merely grocery lists and uh, chores that she had to do, but she also recorded her fears and anxieties and potential threats to me as well. <laughs> um, and oh. she also uh, was a clipper. She was constantly cutting out articles from the newspaper, and these were uh, throughout the house as well. So I come by this trait naturally. Her great uncle Jockey, as we learn in the book, also was somebody who took lots of notes, both mental notes and, and had little bits of paper on yeah. which he kept track of vital information. But um, in terms of my own note taking, uh, returning to your specific question, I had to go back and forth between Montreal very frequently in the uh, several years when I my mother was failing. And uh, it, these trips became an increasingly upsetting as I did not know sometimes whether I would see her again. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and my way of coping with that and 
both trying to remember it and in a sense also creating some distance from it that allowed me to function was to take notes on my journeys home. Yeah. Um, I was often alone at that time, even though I have a very supportive husband. Uh, he couldn't be with me all the time. And increasingly, I had to make these trips myself as he was holding the fort in Toronto and getting on with his own work. So I did have a lot of detail there, but I also was able to hear my mother's voice and fill in where I needed to. Um, and I think it was helpful too to have that dialogue in the book because yeah. obviously with the other historical personalities, apart from places where I did a bit of inventing, you don't have dialogue. Although I tried to introduce uh, different voices uh, through their writing in some cases or what others had written about them. Yeah, no, yeah. I thought you did a great job. I, I the relationship Thank between you. you and your mom was very emotionally wrought, and I and I, in in a lot of the scenes, especially when Darlene was in the room. Yes, she was also a, a a great addition to the emotional depth to to bring the emotional depth of of yes those scenes. Yeah, out. I modeled Darlene after uh, one of my mother's caregivers. I did mention at the back of the book mm -hmm. that some of the more minor characters were either composites uh, or did not have their real names. And that was because in those cases, I couldn't always remember exactly what mm -hmm. somebody had said, uh, nor did I necessarily feel I had the rightness to represent them uh, in some cases. So that's how I handled that aspect. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Yeah. Um, I want to talk to you about memoir and memory, but before sure. we get into that, because I feel like that's going to be a, a, a par big part of our conversation, at least I'm hoping it's going to be yes. a big part of our conversation. I loved the treasure hunt. Yes. <laughs> and I, you know, the, the scene that you shared with us uh, at the opening of your reading mm -hmm. was a favorite scene. And, oh, good. <laughs> um, I, I love, I mean, everyone loves tension in a book, whether yes. it's memoir or, or, or fiction. Yeah. Uh, and I loved how it played out throughout the novel and mm -hmm. it, that search for treasure and the discovery of, of your own treasures. And exactly. Or not. Yeah. And uh, I thought was fantastic. Was this a structure again, because I have no experience with memoir and I mm -hmm. on reading memoir, I'm always fascinated how um, a writer comes to decide on chronology or yes. structure or any of that. So did you know that's how you were going to structure it as you not necessarily. Uh, first of all, uh, when I wrote that what became the first chapter, I wasn't certain that I was writing a book. Uh, I knew I had a great story there and an original story that begged to be written, but I, I thought possibly it could be a standalone story. Um, and so I began it with that idea. And then it seemed clear that in a way my father had set the tone for me and for my explorations of the house because I won't say whether or not I found the original treasure I was looking for because some people here may not have re read the book and could still but uh, I began afterwards to look for other things in the house or to find them sometimes by serendipity uh, including these objects that belong to uh, the several family members we've talked about. Uh, we haven't said much about my grandfather, Simon Kirsch, whom I never knew, but he was a botanist and uh, a land developer in Montreal. This is going back quite early because my mother was much younger than my father. So uh, my grandfather, whom I never knew, uh, was very active in the early uh, and mid 20th century. And uh, I, I found his microscope, which gives the title to the book, um, his botanist microscope. The smallest objective is actually uh, the lens of the microscope with the greatest power of magnification. Mm -hmm. And that in a way became a metaphor for the whole book, the idea of a close up yeah. examination of family and objects. Mm -hmm. um, and, and there's a photograph of it in the book, incidentally, for those who haven't actually seen the book. And um, yeah, so, so I guess I, I began to realize in hindsight, because I didn't think as I was accumulating these items and going through the house that I had the material for a book. I wasn't thinking about the experience at that time as a literary one, potentially. Uh, but in, in hindsight, I realized I had all these objects and they had stories to tell uh, and they gave rise to the stories of the people. And each of those objects was in its way as a treasure, as were the lost family members uh, of whom I had very little awareness before I began working on this. And then there were other coincidental factors, like the fact that, you know, the book I found belonging to Carol is called A Treasure for My Daughter. Uh, and so 
e you can find sometimes in nonfiction work that you have coincidences you might not dare to put into fiction because you'd be accused of uh, creating something contrived, but in fact, they are real. Yeah. Um, and there, yeah. So the, uh, the way that I had to uh, weave the book together though, really required that my mother's story be, I think the backbone of it throughout. Um, Cause I did write uh, each of the chapters about the individual family members, uh, one after the other, as I discovered their <laughs> objects. And then it became clear that some through line, stronger through line was needed. And so uh, my mother was that through line, the years of her decline. And I added some chapters at that point, the chapter um, about her own relationship to the home that I was about to sell, mm -hmm. uh, which is shut out the yesterdays. And then uh, the chapter counterclockwise, for instance, I added, which was about my mother caring for my father during his final illness. Uh, so she became a more central personality. And some of the dialogue uh, you were saying you enjoyed, I, I added and fortified as part of that process as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. She was definitely, I, I agree with that, with your use of the word backbone. She is definitely the central focus of the, of the book. And yes. I felt constantly like I was looking forward to going back, uh, yeah. check on her, you know. <laughs> Yeah, I have a woman, um, a, another writer friend whom I call my writing partner with whom I exchange work and she, bless her, read many, many drafts of this book and right from the get go she said to me, I think this book is about your mother. <laughs> and um, so she was more insightful in a sense than I was. I knew that was true in the sense I realized that the emotional tone of the book was for my analogy for my mother and for lost people. Um, but that that became more prominent as I as yeah. I went through the various drafts and my writing partner was correct. Yeah, yes, so, that's great. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and there's always and that's what I love about the the I, 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 I I'm not sure if I mentioned it to you or I mentioned it somewhere else. I, I felt like in reading the book, I was walking down a hallway um, a, a, of discovery. And oh, I, okay. I loved no, I, you it. hadn't and, said that to me. And I, I mean, I, my, one of my takeaways, one of many of my takeaways was when you talked about that waistcoat button and yes. the, the button collection, I went on a deep dive because I imagined <laughs> this little waistcoat button with the horse painted on it. And I thought uh, as a, a, a person who loves sewing, I don't do it yes. a lot, but I love sewing. And I thought I'm going to start collecting buttons oh I, excellent I, we'll yeah. be competitors <laughs> i don't know if i <laughs> or oh, do you have a button collection i do yes oh, well, I'll, I'll i'll call you in a couple of years and uh I'm, that's okay I'm all you really who, who obsesses and then you know I'll, I'll get to 12 really fantastic buttons and then that'll be the end of it well you just need some elderly relatives with button boxes to get right. you going yeah they're much harder to find uh, commercially than probably through family or heirlooms or friends. Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Very unique ones. Yes, yeah. exactly. So uh, this is my last question, everybody. Mm -hmm. So if, you, if uh, anybody out there has any questions that they would like to ask uh, that sh uh, Sharon hasn't uh, covered in our discussion so far, feel free to put it in the chat and Kaylee will pose that question on your behalf. Um, the big question I wanted to talk about is, uh, and, and again, I put down the book when I came to this uh, particular quote, because it reflected on a conversation I had with a number of writers in the past, one of whom's actually in the room today, where we talked about creative nonfiction and, mm -hmm. and you know, how we define creative nonfiction and how that compares to memoir and the authenticity of it and where the license to be creative, you know, where the line to it is yes. drawn uh, between that. And the quote uh, you include in the book is from Jonathan Foster and mm -hmm. his book called Memory. And he says, recollections of the past may contain elements of the past that as a whole make for an imperfect reconstruction of the past located in the present, mm -hmm. which I thought was just um, like it encapsulated the the truth of nonfiction, if that yes. makes sense yeah in the mind of a creative person mm -hmm. right like mm -hmm. it, it feels in what and and the research that i did in reading him that it's almost impossible for a creative person to to tell the truth if that makes yes. sense right 
And yeah. so I wanted to talk to you about that, about memoir and mm-hmm. memory and how, how the truth and, and the creative mind intertwine and how that yeah. works for this yeah. Well, that's a, a, a really fertile area for discussion and a big one. Um, I, yeah, I, I, I guess I will begin by saying I didn't say anything in the book that was knowingly untrue. Mm-hmm. However, as you said, based on the uh, quote about memoir, truth is, is a very elusive thing. Uh, and I think we all have to recognize this. My uncle Jockey, great uncle Jockey knew that. He really uh, lived in a post-truth world of invention uh, and partial truth. And so I wasn't really after uh, the hard facts in this book. Obviously I needed some as the backbone of the book, but I should say that uh, part of my research process was involved exclusion as well as uh, the pursuit of information. So one decision I made instinctively early on was that I was not going to seek out information from extended family who might have contributed their own anecdotes and recollections. And I felt uh, somehow that would dilute uh, my my own perspective that I wanted to bring to the story and the specific tone that I hope to develop for it. Uh, that I also was aware, as you were saying, that anybody else's so-called memories uh, were not necessarily accurate Mm -hmm. uh, or factually correct. And so I think we all have to acknowledge um, whether we are trying to write creatively or even uh, in pursuit of a a more straightforward uh, nonfiction work that there can be no certainty Uh, Mm -hmm. about factual truth in many cases. And I know we have at least one person here tonight who is a historian who I'm sure also could confirm that for us uh, because perceptions obviously of what is true historically change too. The the historical narrative changes as we go through different times. Um, So I think that we do, according to current theories of memory, or many of them, we do actually uh, embroider memories as we go through time, that the original memory is not uh, something locked into a chest and concrete and in a specific place as we might have imagined in the past, but instead uh, memory is an active thing that is constantly reimagined as we go through time. And I think I tried to bring that sensibility to the book. I also try to to create uh, my own feeling about each personality there, each one of the historical personalities, and um, to to imagine them in some vivid way, which I acknowledge was personal to me, Mm -hmm. uh, not a deliberate distortion, but something that I had to feel very strongly and try to convey to the reader. Yeah. Yeah. And I I love there's a a, a section of, of, and I can't can't remember which chapter, where you talk about the experience emotional experiences it attached to objects or yes to those postcards from Carol. yeah yeah and that each experience you had or yes we have you know anyone has in life is influenced by your emotional experience of it sure right? so not just it's 2 p.m and this happened but everything that's happening emotionally around exactly and you yeah. did such a great job every every moment of of truth right where we're seeing something uh, as it's laid out whether um creatively or or authentically has a very strong emotional memory to it as well which i thank you I, I yeah well done Really well, well, you know, when I think of something like uh, my Aunt Carol's story, obviously, I was telling it everything I came across and saw from her, I was with the, the realization of what happened to her mm-hmm. in the end, at the end of her life. And that is the kind of uh, subjective dimension we bring. I mean, it's both factual, because what happened was obviously uh, incontrovertible. But at the same time, it was my knowledge of her story that yeah. influenced how I felt about recovering those objects, uh, as yeah. well as what my mother had contributed to my sense of her sister. And my yeah. mother didn't talk about her sister a great deal, because it was such a painful okay. subject for her, mm-hmm. as but, you could imagine. 
again, those, those objects, those postcards just in and of themselves. And I don't want to, to, um, uh, you know, get rid of the, of the, the tragedy of her life by saying, by talking about the humor, but some of those postcards are just funny because, yeah. you know, it, it's not just the time difference in, in, in how we were back then and how we are sure. now, but I, you know, I happen to have a daughter who's here, Kaylee, uh, uh-huh. <laughs> is a hard writer. And yeah. so she writes postcards. She's well-traveled and writes postcards from wherever she goes and her postcards compared to Carol's postcards. Um, and just so funny, just, and, and you can, I could imagine Carol and yeah. her new husband on these Caribbean vacations and island hopping. It was a uh, very enjoyable part. For of sure. Them. And she was a person clearly with a great zest for life and, <laughs> uh, you know, um, incredible appetites and energy. And, and she was very young yeah. because of course yeah. people in, in those days did marry very young uh, mm-hmm. by, by the standards of today. And uh, yeah. yeah, so no, absolutely. I think, I think they were great fun as well as mm-hmm. being poignant. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, well, that is it for my selfish questions and everything. Oh, those were great I questions, wanted, Alison. Thank I you. Wanted, I wanted answered. Uh, so I'll open it up, Kaylee, to um, anybody who has questions for Sharon. Yeah, uh, we have a question from Robert. And Robert okay. asks, yes. was one of the characters more meaningful to you for you to explore? Oh, that's interesting. Um, Probably I couldn't choose. I think they all complemented one another really well. You know, we've got somebody who was an immigrant, who my grandfather, Simon, who came over to Canada at the age of six from Russian occupied Lithuania uh, and was a very uh, straight person, straight in the sense of uh, not gender orientation, but somebody who was conventional, I guess, let us say, Mm -hmm. in his achievement and the kind of career he had, although not a dull person, I don't think, uh, and also somebody of tremendous energy. Then we have somebody, the absolute antithesis, Jockey Fleming, who is the disgrace of the family, not the pride of it, and living at the margins of the law. And then we have Carol, a much younger person. These also represent three different uh, generations of the immigrant experience. We've got the new immigrant in my grandfather, uh, the child of immigrants in uh, Jockey, and then we have a second generation Canadian in Carol uh, growing up at quite a different time. So I think I enjoyed them all equally, honestly, uh, in their yeah. different ways. Yeah, they each of them need their own book. Yeah, and each life had each life had its drama. I thought, you know, sometimes you think, well, should you write something about your family because maybe it's not interesting? But I felt each of those lives was quite dramatic in yeah. a genuine way. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Kaylee. That's it. That's oh, it. Okay. I Oh, there's something you. up coming up there in the chat, I see. Oh, well, yeah, just literally as we started <laughs> to move on, we Good. we got another one. Hi. Good um on. so that was from Monica and Monica says you talked about your memory and the impact of your subjective/emotional experience on it. Isn't this further complicated here by the fact that you describe your mother at a time when her own memory was failing? Yeah, that's a very good question. Absolutely. I think that uh, juxtaposition is really interesting. Um, my, I was part of my, I guess, impetus for trying to recover so much was I knew that my mother was no longer a source of memories uh, that she could share with me. And that is still a regret. I, I will never be able to ask her certain things I never thought to. Um, so there's a dance there uh, between the two. And of course, even when somebody is losing their memory, there can still be things that they're able to recall. Uh, My mother didn't conform to the most typical memory loss in so far as it wasn't always things that were in the distant past she could remember and more immediate things that she would forget. Um, But there's also a lot of confusion uh, involved with that. And I think the whole book, in a sense, uh, to respond to Monica, takes uh, that that kind of uh, dynamic between 
recovery of things and and loss and clarity and confusion and I think the way it resolves itself ultimately is that I have to recognize as the narrator uh, that you simply cannot fathom everything and that uh, things that are accessible to us only as mysteries and where we might imagine uh, answers to the missing missing information can be as valuable as what we do uh, find uh, more conclusively. Yes, yeah, no, I totally agree. Um, I'm, I'm um, fascinated with the idea of, hold on, I won't go, I shouldn't, I do this all the time. I wanna extend the conversation for hours, but- Oh, I'm go ahead. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm just fascinated by uh, that experience uh, of a person uh, having lost family members, you know, how, why we are so reluctant to, to want to dig deeper after we lose the chance to dig deeper, you know, and if, yeah. and if, if the, the stories we want to make up ourselves are more important than the story that actually existed, if you know what I mean. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, well, I guess those of us with a writing inclination at some level have a, an urge to take control of the narrative. Right. Yeah. Um, and so we have to acknowledge that even when we're dealing with lives that were real and factual, um, that we are also there steering uh, the story. But there are many stories and so many ways to look at a life that mm -hmm. I don't think you can say any of them are wrong. Perhaps it's wrong yeah. to write or, or morally questionable to write something called nonfiction, where there's a degree of distortion that is really quite extreme. Um, right. And at least yeah. if you're going to do that, you should acknowledge it, I think, to the reader. Um, mm -hmm. But beyond that, I think, you know, we are we all inhabit a world where ultimately we can't be sure uh, which yeah. which story is correct and probably the truth lies somewhere in the multiplicity of stories told about somebody um, yeah i mean uh, you know even biography and autobiography right mm -hmm. i mean they're all uh left to interpretation because you can't give a, a chronology of a of a celebrity's life from birth to to death and include everything and so just in the in the decision to include certain things yes you're offering the reader an interpretation of the life as opposed to exactly an, an authentic yeah. representation of the exactly life, right? there's a, a process of selection that is yeah. inevitable and each person would do that differently i've no yeah. doubt if somebody else in my family were to tell these same stories mm -hmm. uh they would come across quite differently um yeah. and you know the emphasis is always uh, coming from our own perceptions and our own orientations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and as you, as you said before, with memoir, there's a selection, there's a selection mm -hmm. process because, um, as you said, with Carol not wanting to go down, uh, you know, a certain uh, narrative uh, for for personal protection, protection, yes. reasons, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. All right, we've got yeah. one more question, Kaylee. Okay. And then we're going to do the raffle. Our, our last question is from Maria mm -hmm. and Maria says one of the one of my favorite aspects of the book is that there are so many types of archives and archivists in it. Do you have any thoughts on that? Um, let me see the different. Well, I, I went to archives, literally, uh, I went to a few, but I think Maria is probably referring also to this in a broader sense. So, yes, the house itself is a kind of archive and all the possessions I retrieve there. And I know Maria, who has also written a memoir of her grandmother, uh, was coached actually, I think, by a, an archivist in how to keep everything intact and in order, which can be a valuable lesson. I did my best as an amateur uh, to, to keep things the way my mother had placed them in the basement. Even though I was exploring things, I also tried to leave her order intact. Um, and so that is one aspect uh, that is archival. Uh, then there were obviously my mother's own archives she kept within the house in the sense of all of her clippings. And there were filing cabinets full of papers and she had 
you know, inserted headings for the various topics, particularly things that inspired fear in her. <laughs> and I'm so glad she yeah. did not have to live through this pandemic. I often Gosh. say that to my husband. Um, and so, yeah, those were another type of archive. I have kept a lot of it. Sadly, I couldn't keep everything, but I did keep examples of all of my mother's archives. And I have kept, for instance, the brown a uh, faux leatherette suitcase, which um, is mentioned a number of times in the book in the context of both Jockey and Carol. It had belonged to uh, my grandmother on my mother's side. That is something I kept and where I have tried to uh, leave the, the arrangement in essentially uh, the order in which I found it, even though I delve in there quite often and uh, look at things. So yeah, thank you for that question. Yeah. and everybody else for those questions as well. We definitely see archives as part of the retelling of Simon <laughs> Kirsch's story when yes. you, you start talking about the architectural history of, of Montreal. Yes. I imagine any any archivist would read that section and just immediately start fantasizing about the architectural archives and, and the history of Montreal. and, and For sure. Goes. Well, I should just add uh, that the uh, archivist for the Canadian Jewish archives attended my virtual book launch. And when I described the book to her, because I had, she had been kind in sharing a few things. There were not many things uh, accessible from her archives, but there were a few about my grandfather, Simon. But as soon as I described the book to her and said that it had been published, she said to me, this sounds like something that archivists would love. <laughs> so, yeah. 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 Well, that's so great. Thank you so much, everybody. I'm going to do the raffle. I'm very excited. Thank you, Sharon. We've got oh, thank you so much, Alison. It was a lovely conversation. Yeah, no, it was great. I've been looking for, forward to this for a few weeks. Likewise. Um, uh, we have two copies of your book to uh, raffle off today, which is very exciting. Um, if you are a winner, Kaylee is going to uh, do the raffle. If you are a winner of one of the copies and you already own a copy of Sharon's book, um, feel free to share uh, a mailing address. We are uh, we're doing a little drive-by thing. Sharon and I are going to meet and distantly uh, yes, mass and the book talk. <laughs> yeah. yep. um, and so if there is somebody hopefully in Toronto that you would like to gift the book to if you've already read it, I'm happy to drop it off to them. Um, uh, so here we go, Kaylee. All right, we've got our names in here. All right, our first winner for this evening is Nora Banksix. Banksix. <laughs> I knew as soon as I saw your name, I was going to pronounce it wrong. So I'm so sorry. <laughs> That's the first one. And our second one is Nora Gold. It's an evening for Nora's. No, oh, that's Nora funny. Nice. <laughs> I know Nora was here. And she, she kind of had to she never meet another Nora. <laughs> yes. Congratulations, Nora's. Thank you. Um, send an email, uh, no, the, Nora, you're here. Send an email to me at junctionrights at gmail.com. Share your uh, address. I will. And, uh, and I'll make sure that that book either gets dropped off or uh, mailed out to you, depending on where you are. Um, and I will, I know uh, Nora Gold, so I will email her and, uh, and congratulate her on winning. Um, thank you so much again, Sharon. Uh, for everybody here, as you may or may not know, this coming Saturday, April 24th, is Canadian Independent Bookstore Day uh, at junctionreads.ca. I've shared uh, uh, what I hope is an inclusive list of independent bookstores in Toronto. Please consider buying Sharon's book from an independent bookstore if you're looking. Um, I have noted uh, where you can get Sharon's book. I, uh, another story has it in stock. Um, and Book City and uh, I think it's Queen Books have it. Yeah, Queen Books, yeah, it should have, yeah. yeah. Does Queen Book have it? I think- They I did have it in stock. I don't know whether they I still might, do it this I may time. be mixing up, yeah. uh, but there are links to all of the independent bookstores in Toronto. Uh, and mm -hmm. there's a link to a map of independent bookstores in Canada. It's not very uh, inclusive though. So um, if you're not in, in Toronto, feel free to send me a note. I will find an independent bookstore near you uh, and hopefully get you a copy of Sharon's books and any other books you would like to uh, get your hands on. I hope you will join. We've only got four more readings left of the season. Next week, I get to sit down with my very good friend, uh, a writer's retreat buddy, Marissa Stapley. I'm going to talk about her book, Lucky, 
and uh, and check out the website for all of our other readings. Sharon, again, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Alison. It was much, very enjoyable. Yes, and Kaylee, thank you so much as always for your uh, technical expertise and your event coordination. Yes, thank you very much, Kaylee. Bye. Bye. Maria, Mark, Nora, everybody, see you. Have a great night. Take care. <laughs>